Hey everybody, it's Christopher. Well, I got a lot of response from my last video I did, and by responses, I mean I got phone calls from friends that said, dude, you're sewing quilts. Oh my God, because I have a lot of friends out there who sew quilts. But my one good friend, she calls me, and she likes to use colorful language a lot. <laughs> and she said, bitch, I tried that double-sided leather tape because you know I'm making vinyl handbags. And she goes, I tried that on the fabric and that. She goes, on my regular domestic sewing machine and it stuck and it gummed up. And she goes, do you have any other suggestion? I thought, oh gosh, I didn't have this problem. But if she's got that problem, then there must be other people who are going to have that problem too. And I don't want you all writing bad things and saying, you told me to do this and it didn't work and that. So I'm going to show you an alternative, okay? So stay with me, I'll be right back. Here's a quilt I made a while back. And you see my signature trim with metallic thread. This was a fun quilt. I actually taught this um, block in a class when I was teaching basic sewing. So, yeah. So you could have a lot of fun with metallic, uh, metallic trim, metallic trim thread, you know. It's just, and you know, just dress it up. <clears throat> make quilting fun. Make it fun, make it your own. And that's what I did, made it my own. And then I did this just big, big swirl stitches here. So even though I'm not a real quilter, you can see you can make it work so anybody can do it. Anybody can do it and just have fun with it. And look what I use for binding. I'm going to show you what I use for binding. For binding, I used webbing. I used webbing for binding. That's pretty cool. I mean, look at that. So your options are limitless with everything. Just think outside the box. Think outside the box. Okay, welcome back. So, from the last video when I showed you how to stick down this this trim to do your decorative, my, to do my decorative sewing uh, with metallic thread, you could see as I was sewing in my last video, I was able I was able to do it continuously, and I not have any issues. And like I said, in my other videos, I always told people, I said, you know, for years when I told people to use metallic threads and I would teach them, we I didn't have a YouTube video to give people back then. It was Yahoo groups. And then I came out with my first book, Pillows, and I devised a way of showing people how to put the metallic threads on and make it work and everything. And even told them right the everything. But no one was like having success. And then when the YouTube videos came out, and I started doing YouTube videos, I would demonstrate metallic threads with all the different sewing machines I have from the entry level machine, 1950s Singer vintage machine, all the way up to my top of the line expensive sewing machines and I was having complete flawless results with all my machines. And as the years went by, um, things progressed, like um, different devices became available to use for metallic threads uh, and things like that. So. It, it, those machines were always, always capable of sewing with metallic threads. It's just that a lot of people, um, they were so used to doing one type of sewing, one type of thread, that when you try to teach them something different, it was like trying to get someone who writes with their right hand to write with their left hand. I get it, but a lot of people also, when they put a video on like this, they're going to be fast forwarding through it and they don't listen to everything and then they write underneath the video, could you please tell me what fabric this is? Could you please tell me what machine this is? And I've repeated it so many times in my videos, what I'm using, this and that. So, you know, I don't, I can't respond to every single question. I don't. So if I read, I read your questions or I hear you or I, you know, like my friends call me, I will remember that and in the next video I'll address it. So, yeah, uh, watch and listen to all my videos because it's in here. I'm not going to individually write everybody an answer. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. But I will glance and read and then I'll address it in the videos. With that said, let's move on. So addressing to what my friend said, and she's not a stupid sewer, she's not a novice sewer, 
and she, but she's been basically a couple genres in her life, you know. And I started thinking, I said, well, what can I show other people out there what else to use, all right? Because, you know, putting this trim on. So I said, ah, I remember. So I went into my drawers and I started looking in my stash and I remember I had this. Steam Esteem 2. This is a quarter inch double-sided fusible web. So what I've been doing now to show you, and I'm doing, I'm going to, I've been doing on the, on the um, I'm going to do on my next block, which I don't have to sew the next block, but you can see what I'm doing. What I do is just stick it onto, you know, iron it onto the back of this. Oh, let me just move this out of the way. All right, so you, you lay it on the back of your tape that you're using. This is a decorative trim. Some people call these trims and stuff ribbons, but the ribbons we know are like satin or polyester, and this is not a satin or polyester. And sometimes I'll catch myself calling it a ribbon. So, um, yeah, you just, after a while, it loses its stickiness because normally you can stick this in the back like this. There you go. And then you iron it down. A lot of these notions I have, I've had for a long time, guys. Whenever I was writing books and whenever I was out shopping, um, like when I started writing my books, uh, companies wanted me to feature their products. So I'd write them and say, hey, if you want me to feature your product, send it to me and let me test it. So, And then if I liked it and I kept using it later on, I'd go to the store and I'd buy myself some more. Um, you know, so that's how I got to know about so much product. Uh, being an author, you have to really research and you have to really investigate and try things. Try all different things. So somebody asked me, when am I going to write my third book? And I said, you know, I've been contemplating this third book forever. I don't know when I'm going to write my third book. I really don't. Um, and I really don't know what subject matter it's going to be. I'm, I'm not sure. Because the industry keeps changing so quickly. And there's no paperback books anymore anyway. My second book was on CD. In fact, okay, so this is truth telling now. All right, truth telling. Get ready. I'm going to spill the beans. I'm going to spill the tea. Spill the tea. I'm going to spill the tea. Okay, so now I can talk about this because I never signed a non-disclosure agreement and all this and that. Okay, so my first book was published. Uh, I'm not going to name names. I'm just going to tell you uh, the story. Okay, so my first book was published. I got discovered by this lovely, lovely lady. And she is just, oh my God, she's just, she saw my work and she responded to me because I was putting out uh, feelers from publishers and she happened to be the publisher who was publishing my favorite teachers books for many years and um, so she saw my work and she responded she says we'd love to publish your work and I had a website that put together for myself back then and this was when nobody was really doing websites you know even the sewing stores the mom and pop sewing stores weren't even doing websites. You know, this was like uh, 2005, 2006, something like that. So anyway, I had a website I put together with all my work. And that was my portfolio. All right, long story short, I got published. All right. So after the book came out, she realized I had something there. And then I started, you know, I was going to get on TV shows and everything. And she, she calls me. She says, I want you to write another book. I said, another book? This one's just barely coming out. She goes, yeah, the response on this is going to be great. And she said, but I want you to write another book. I want you to write a book on how to make handbags. I said, handbags? I said, listen. And at that time, all the ladies in home sewing were making the, the granny, granny tote bags, the Vera Bradley cotton bags. And I told her, I said, I'm not going to write a book on making another Vera Bradley bag. She goes, I'd expect you to. She goes, can you write a book on something a little more high-end looking? With, you know, and I said, well, if I do, that's what I'm going to write about. So she goes, I'll send you the contract. And I got off the phone with her and I said, I just agreed to something I've never done before, really. You know, what, what the heck's going to happen? I mean, like, really? And then I got, I got this knot in my stomach and I said, 
I just agreed to, to write a book about a genre I've really never ever perfected, right? So I said, all right, what am I gonna do? Well, the first thing I thought of is, okay, when I get my advancement for this book, I will go to the stores and buy some high-end handbags and tear them apart and see how they're constructed. Because I know how to construct. You just have to know, how, you know what you're constructing. So that's what I did. And I'll never forget, I bought, you guys are going to kill me, but I did. I bought a Prada bag. <laughs> I bought a Prada bag and I ripped it up. <laughs> Luckily, I knew a friend that worked at a high-end department store that was able to get me one on sale and use her discount. So, and when she found out later on what I did with it, she about croaked. So that's how I learned how to construct bags. And then, then my publisher was acquired by another publisher. And then all the people from that little town where my publisher was, if they didn't move to a bigger city, they would have, they, you know, they were losing their job, um, or they could move to the bigger city and, and uh, keep their job. So, unfortunately, my, my editor did not go with the company, and I was really kind of upset because I really liked this guy. He was really, I mean, I put him through a lot with my first book, and, uh, trying to get him to make my book not look like your typical um, grandma's crafter's book, you know, which it ended up looking really, really nice, and the beauty shots they did on it were fabulous. So anyway, when the new publisher took over, they gave me a new editor. Now, this editor said to me, this isn't, this is, oh, there's no, there's no glue there. No wonder it's not sticking. There's no glue, it stopped right there, okay. So the new editor, she was a stick in the mud. She was a real stick in the mud. And I'd said to her, I said, uh, um, cause I, I, in my contract, I said, I want to do all my own. I want to do all my own beauty shots. Cause in all my, in both my books, I was doing all my own step-by-step -step photos. And a lot of people were not doing their own photos back then. You know, this was before everyone had a digital camera and all this and that. And what, what these publishers would do is they would fly the author to the studio, um, wherever the publisher studio was, and they would reenact, uh, reenact step by steps for the books. Where me, as I was creating, I was photographing. So when you see the step by step photos in my book, that's actually the the real project that I'm showing you as I was creating it, right? Which I was so proud of. I mean, it saved a lot of time. I do a step, I take a picture, do another step sewing, take a picture. So I said, not only am I going to continue to do that, but I also want to do my own beauty shots, find my own models, do the hair and the makeup, and everything. So at the time, I was working for uh, a salon where they had a lot of people that worked with me. And uh, my boss, she, such a cute girl, she, she was a model for me. And my coworker agreed to help me with the hair and makeup. So it was a real nice collaboration. It was wonderful. I had complete total control. So then I started sending the beauty shots into the publisher and this, this stick in the mud editor said to me, why do your models have so much makeup on? Why do they look so fancy? I said, excuse me? She goes, why are they so fancy? Why do you have them dressed up so much? And I said, have you seen the handbags? I said, they're not your granny go to the grocery store handbags. And I said to her, let me ask you something. I said, do you read Vogue magazine? She said, no. I said, do you read Harper's Bazaar? No. Do you read Town & Country? No. Do you read Elle? No. What do you read? She goes, uh, Quilters Today. And I said, well, I've listened to you tear me down with this book, and this is not what I signed up for. This was not the original agreement of the book that I decide to write with my previous people under the previous name of this publisher. So I said, either you give me a new, I, get, I need a new editor or I'm not going to move any, I'm not going to move forward with this book. So this was, uh, what year was this? This was right when the economy was crashing in the middle 2000s, 2008, nine. And, uh, the economy was taking a crash and things were changing. And this new publisher was 
decided they were going to do more digital online than they were for paper publication. So, and then they started buying up all these other little companies in the sewing world, right? All right, so what happened was, uh, two weeks later I got a phone call from her manager and she goes, hi Chris, this is so-and-so, and, -so, and I got some bad news. Unfortunately, she said, uh, we have to kill a lot of books that are not in production right now. And she says, and being that yours is just in production, it hasn't gone to printing or anything, she goes, we're gonna have to kill your book as well. And I said, thank you. And she goes, you're not upset? And I said, no, you just gave me my creative freedom back. I said, I have fought with your editor you gave me. She doesn't see my vision that I signed up for. I said, my previous acquisitions manager from the other, the other company you guys bought, you know, they, they got my vision. They worked with me. They bent over backwards. They changed things to see a different life. I said, that book was so successful. I got to travel the country. I was on all these television shows. I said, you know, I just don't get why you guys are treating me this way. So long story short, uh, they uh, told me, you can keep your advancement. I said, well, you better believe I'm going to keep my advancement because you guys broke your contract with me. So I call a friend in the industry. And he's, he's a publisher, and, a, and he's a fashion designer, and he's a teacher. And I said to him, I said, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do now. I said, you know, he says, well, you've got the capability of publishing yourself on CD. He goes, every so often, I put a CD out there. And he goes, you've got an email list? He said, so just put it on CD. So I did. I had CDs made. Then I thought, where am I going to have these CDs printed? So I searched all over, searched all over. And there's a famous singer that I'm friends with on the internet, and she uh, used to be with a publishing company in her music, and they screwed her over. So she started publishing her own music, and she, uh, uh, I called her, or I emailed her, and I said, where do you have your CDs made? And she told me, very kind, thank you, Amber Artist, Artist Amber. And she gave me a good link to CDs that are manufactured and printed in the USA. So, I contacted her, and then after that, I contacted my friend back, and I said to him, I said, hey, I said, Kenneth, because it was Kenneth King who suggested I do the CDs, and I said, I got a source in Jersey that's doing these in America. He goes, oh, thanks for that info. So, we kind of helped each other out on that one. So, anyway, um, I had mass production done with these CDs on my new book, The Pillows, or the uh, Bag Book, and... Since all this happened back then, guess what happened to this publishing company? They've gone defunct. They are no longer in existence. They came into our world, our sewing world. This is how the sewing world used to be. I'm going to explain it to you. This is how our sewing world used to be. Authors, the publishers would discover an artist. They'd get them to write a book. That artist would get on TV shows, travel the country. They were on PBS shows. First of all, they got on PBS shows. And then all the sewing machine dealers would see these artists, what they were doing for their genre. They invite them into their stores across the country, do these big special events. Customers used to come in. They would get educated. Then they end up buying a sewing machine or upgrading or buying accessories. And they kept that small business in business. So these progressive dealers were utilizing the authors and the publishing companies, and they were working hand in hand and helping each other. This new publisher comes in and decides to take over, okay, and they're going to kill paperback books, and they started buying uh, companies in our industry, and now they destroyed everything. You go to the sewing stores, and we knew Digital Era was couldn't be coming out anyway, right? But the way they did it was so aggressive and they just destroyed everything. Well, you don't have big events at sewing machine dealers anymore. You don't have all those sewing shows on TV that promote uh, artists and, and book authors and stuff like they used to anymore. It's just lost its magic. It's lost its magic. And this, the TV shows that are out there, they're so desperate to get anybody just to fill that episode to teach something. These people are not authors. They're not writers. They don't have anything really documented. And it's not the same as it used to be, you know. 
um, it, there was a value back then to sewing because that's how I first started learning how to sew also was you know I found these shows on PBS and Sewing with Nancy was one of my most favorite ones and then I'd go to the store and I'd buy what she was using excuse me and then I mean it, it just it was so inspiring well today on the internet you have YouTube now that at least inspires people but there's so much non-professional sewing out there and I've talked about this before and it really bothers me because when I learned how to sew, I watched Nancy, she always had that extension table on her sewing machine, the fabric never dragged, you know, and now all these online, all these online sewing places that pop up on Facebook for advertisements want you to subscribe to sign up for their, their sewing um, websites where they have all these videos to watch but none of it's professional sewing. You know, you've got, you got this, this is, this is the sewing machine. Let's pretend this is the sewing machine, okay? Instead of having an extension table all the way over here, they don't. So when they're sewing, that fabric is dragging off the edge and they're pushing it like this and there's no professionalism. There's no professional sewing there. So it's just like teaching bad habits all over again. It's just these bad habits keep being taught over and over and over and over again. And the new people don't know. They don't understand. So it's people like me that has to keep voicing that out there and telling you all, you know, if you're going to pay for sewing, pay for professional sewing, so at least you're taught the right way. Anyway, so, yeah. All right, so I want to thank everybody out there. Um, times are tough right now. And so anyway, this is, then you peel the tape off and you, you peel this tape off. Let me see, where's my... So just like the glue, this like the tape, glue tape on the other one, the leather tape. You peel it off, you lay it on your seam. Can you see this? Let me see if I can get this in the camera here. Here. So you peel it off, you stick it down, and you hit it with your iron, and then you go do your sewing. So that's another alternative from the last video I showed you guys. For those, like my friend who called and said, Bitch, it's sticking up my needle. How come yours wasn't sticking up your needle? <laughs> I said, girl, let me find something. I'm sorry. She goes, well, you know, if it's happened to me, it's got to be happening to other people. And I'm like, well, how come it never happens to me? How come, how come I sew, you know, I sewed it all. And I even did it on vinyl. You know, I was trying to show it even on vinyl, vinyl fabric, you know, sticky, sticky. And then I, as you saw my last video, I wasn't having any problems, but some of you might have problems. So I hope this helps. Okay. All right, take care. I hope you enjoyed that story of the truth in our industry. And um, yeah, it's, uh, we all been through a lot out here. We're all survivors and now we're all surviving right now. We're all surviving right now. It's, um, it's a time in world history where the greatest thing that's coming from this though is we have social media, the internet. Can you imagine if we didn't have the internet right now and everybody was confined to their home, all we, had to, all we would have to rely on is the newspaper. But think, the newspaper and the television. But think about this. In 1917, they didn't even have a, a, a television. All they had was a newspaper. And they didn't have the technology or the medicine like we do today. Even though we still don't have a vaccine for this virus, um, we still have advanced technology and it's, gonna, it's coming. But people have to do their part to help control this virus. People have to make sure they wear their masks. They practice social distancing to a sense where not being in crowds like all the protesters we saw. You know, please, you know, wear your mask. Do whatever you have to to protect yourself and protect other people from you and you from vice versa because everybody could be a carrier. So protect, protect. We all have to go back to work. And the only way we're going to be able to go back to work is if we were safe. So all the people who were bitching and moaning, they had to wear masks. I'm not wearing a mask. This is a free country. I could do what I want. Get it. You know, I'm going to ask you this right now. I'm going to beg you. Take that brain that God gave you and put it to use. Put it to use. Put it to use. Wear a mask. Protection. If we want this virus contained, and we want less deaths, we have to protect ourselves and prevent contamination. Because we all need to go back to work. 
But we got to go back to work safely. It's the only way it's going to happen until a virus, a vaccine, is discovered. All right, guys. I love you. Take care. And um, be safe and be creative while you're home. Take advantage of this time to be creative and, and play and discover everything. And if you have a sewing machine that you uh, never used all these years, get it out, clean it, unscrew it, see if it needs oiling. If it's one of those machines that does need oiling, you know, get it going and um, get some old bed sheets, every, anything you can to practice and play and be creative because you need to do it. You need to make a mask. You know, if you're in a situation where you can't afford a mask, but you have a sewing machine, um, I'm not going to tell you to go find someone who's giving away a free mask. I'm going to tell you to get that damn sewing machine that you've been keeping in your closet. You've been too lazy to pull out. Pull it out and learn. There's social media. There's YouTube. You can learn how to thread a machine, do everything right now because of YouTube. There are still good videos on there to teach you how to sew and how to run a machine. There's no excuse. And we all have rags in our home. Everyone has some type of rag or an old garment that we've been saving to wear because we grew out of it 100 years ago. And we're still in our closet thinking we're going to fit into it. You know it's not going to happen. Pull it out, cut it up, make a mask out of it. All right. Talk to you later. Love you. Bye.